Hi all, welcome to my channel. In the last video we met Grandma. She's a 1912 Singer 27 treadle machine. I showed you how to get the treadle going. If you haven't seen that video yet, there's a link in the description box below. Today's video we will be looking at the different parts that make Grandma work. Now even though Grandma at 180 is an antique, many of her working parts can still be found in sewing machines today. So without further ado, let's get right into it and find out what they are. First up is the hand wheel, so called because you use your hand to work it. It's also known as the balance wheel, particularly in the newer electric machines, only it's a lot smaller. The hand wheel allows you to move the needle up and down and it also moves the bobbin from side to side. It's incredibly useful to be able to use a hand wheel on a sewing machine because it gives you better control over the needle, particularly if you need to stitch slowly. If you're going across thick fabric for instance or if you're coming over a bumpy seam you can literally just do one stitch at a time. Inside the hand wheel is another little wheel which only turns left and right. Now this little wheel comes in useful for when you're using the bobbin winder. By turning it, it stops the needle from moving. And in turn, because the needle's not moving, neither is the bobbin. And what this does is it stops you ending up getting a knotty needle over here because your bobbin thread's getting caught up in the underworkings of the machine and allows you to safely wind your bobbin. But you should always remember to do it back up because you're going to be sat there for ages trying to work out why your needle's not moving otherwise. <laughs> going from the hand wheel down to the lower part of the machine we have a little belt. This is how the machine actually works. It connects this top wheel to the bottom wheel which we'll look at it in a moment. It's made of leather and if I just turn it around a little bit it's actually one strip of leather that is connected together using a metal staple. It might look rough but that is actually the correct way of attaching um, a treadle belt to a treadle machine. It's actually adjustable so sometimes when um, the belt stretches you can actually take a little bit off and re reapply the staple. Following the belt to underneath the table it goes into the belt guide which goes around the band wheel. On the side of the band wheel is a dress guard which pretty much works the same way as a chain guard on a bike. It stops your clothes getting trapped which was very important in 1912 when grandma was made because the ladies back then used to wear long skirts. Also on the band wheel is the belt shifter. This helps you get the belt on and off. When you're not using your treadle machine you should disengage the belt because that takes the strain off the leather and it will stop it stretching and that will make your belt last longer. The treadle where the machine actually gets its name from oops, is the pedal where you put your feet. This is joined to the band wheel by this little metal rod going up the back there and finishing here. That is the pitman arm. And that's the little gizmo that helps transfer the, oops, the up and down of the pedal into the circular motion for the band wheel. It's a strange name for a gadget, so I did a bit of digging and it turns out that the pitman arm isn't unique to treadle machines or sewing machines for that matter. It gets used in any situation where you need a straight movement converted to a circular one or vice versa. Take the steering mechanism in trucks and cars for instance, they use a pitman arm. <laughs> Who knew? Well, apart from engineers and mechanics of course. Anyway, there are a couple of stories about how this particular device got its name. 
and I'll put the links to all the information that I found in the description box below. The first story revolves around timber cutting. In the days before there were sawmills, there used to be something called a pit saw, where you'd get one guy on the top of a log and another guy underneath the log in a pit and together they would pull a two-man saw um, to cut the log. Now, the one in the pit underneath the log was known as the pit man because he was literally a man in a pit. When sawmills were introduced, the arm that drove the energy change from circular to up and down was called the pitman arm after the pitman. The second story revolves around a guy called George Washington Pittman with two T's who was born in about 1814. Now he was a railroad engineer who worked in northern Alabama for the railroad and apparently he invented the Pittman arm because he was a railroad employee and I'm like that's it that's all I'm getting that's the total story. Um, the only information I've been able to find about George Washington Pittman is on a website called Info Galactic. The link is down below. Um, this is the only website that I found anything about him. I've never heard of this website before. I'm a little bit dubious as to the accuracy of the information, but it's there, so I'm mentioning it as a possibility as to how this device got its name. I did a little bit more digging because I really wasn't happy with what I was coming up with and I managed to discover a lady called Tabitha Babbitt, a shaker. In around 1810 she repurposed a spinning wheel into a circular saw. Now her spinning wheel was treadle powered and basically all she did was she changed the wheel into a circular saw blade. Now the reason why she did that was because she'd been watching two guys one on top of a log and one standing in a pit struggling to move this saw up and down to chop the log. She did this in 1810, that's four years before George Washington Pittman was born. Having a treadle powered spinning wheel in 1810 kind of suggests to me that Pittman arms were a thing before the enterprising Tabitha stopped spinning yarn and started sawing wood. Sorry George. I've put a link to the history behind circular saws in the description. Delving even deeper into this little rabbit hole, I came across a Dutchman called Cornelis Cornelissoon. I really hope I said that right. He lived from 1550 to 1607 and he is credited with introducing the powered sawmill. He fitted a crankshaft to a windmill to convert the turning motion to an up and down movement. Now that for that he would have needed a Pitman arm. I think I'm going to go with the Pitman story as being the one as how this gadget got its name. If any of you out there knows of another reason why this gadget is called a Pitman arm I'd love to hear it so if you want to share it in the comments below that would be brilliant. Anyway it's time to get back to grandma. Next to the hand wheel you have this tall upright which is known as the pillar and on the pillar you'll find the stitch length adjuster. Now this only adjusts the stitch length on grandma because she's a straight stitch only machine. Underneath the adjuster is the bobbin winder. To work the bobbin winder what you do is disconnect your needle so that it doesn't move. Remember we need the needle and the bobbin not to move while you're winding a bobbin over here so that you don't get knotty needles underneath the machine. You move the winding mechanism onto the belt and then just as you would if you were stitching you work your hand wheel until you get your treadle working and then this will wind thread onto a bobbin that's in there. It's quite neat really. And to stop it you just gently grab hold of the hand wheel. To disengage the bobbin mechanism you just push it back like that. And remember to reconnect your needle. This part across here is known 
as the sewing machine arm. This is the thread spool. This little metal part here. And there's usually on these older machines a little piece of felt which just sits on the bottom of your thread spool and protects the base of the machine from friction caused by a spinning spool of thread. Most of the time these disappear. They get used for other machines or they wear out. But you can replace them with any bit of felt really. The gap between the pillar and the needle is known as the throat. Now, the bigger the throat space, the bigger or bulkier items you're able to sew on a sewing machine. The bigger the space is incredibly useful if you're a quilter and you want to quilt your own quilts at home without having to go to a long arm. Because obviously the more space, the more you can roll your quilt and the more you can actually work on at any one time. At the front of the machine you'll find the throat plate, the needle bar, the needle, the needle clamp that keeps the needle in place, the presser foot. If you follow this bar all the way up to the top you come to the presser foot adjuster knob. Now with this you can change the pressure that the presser foot applies to the fabric. So if you've got a light delicate fabric you might want to have less pressure on that so you'd adjust that there. So the front of the machine we have the tension discs which help you keep just the right amount of tension on your thread so that you can perform the perfect stitch for the fabric that you're stitching with. Underneath the presser foot you've got what's known as feed dogs. Now what these do is they actually move the fabric through the machine as you're stitching so they'll they'll pull the fabric backwards for you. Towards the back of the machine you have what's known as a take-up lever and this just raises and lowers the presser foot onto the fabric. If we take the throat plate off you can see the bobbin housing and the bullet shaped bobbin. To get the bobbin out you just push on the pointed bit and it just pops straight out like that. Now because Grandma is a vibrating shuttle machine she has a bullet shaped bobbin case and this casing houses a long bobbin like that. Now a vibrating shuttle is slightly different to modern day machines in that the bobbin doesn't go round. And if I zoom in just a little bit oops. Now as I turn the hand wheel you'll notice that the bobbin casing goes from side to side like so. Legend has it, or it could be just an urban myth, the reason why the early bobbins are bullet shaped was due to the Singer engineers being from the munitions industry. I haven't been able to find anything that can back this up so for now it's going to have to stay a little bit of an urban myth but it does have a little bit of credence to it. During World War II the Singer Corporation was contracted by the US government to make handguns and they famously made a batch of 545 calibre handguns. Now these guns made by the same company that makes the sewing machines are incredibly rare and highly collectible. Check out the link below to see what one recently sold for at auction back in 2017. It's gobsmacking. Thinking about it and bearing that in mind, maybe it's bullets that are bobbin shaped. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, give it a thumbs up. If you have any questions, leave me a comment. If you want to see any more videos or maybe go down some more rabbit holes with me, subscribe to my channel and hit that little bell to make sure you get notified next time I upload a video. Thank you ever so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye for now.